What would you think if you had to run a walk over 500 miles with little rest? You could bring very little food and therefore would need to forage along the way. Also, you would not have any money or modern day credit cards. And you would not be welcome or could not afford to stay in hotels along the way. Make things even more difficult, you would not have maps or even road signs to help you to determine your route. Finally, imagine every policeman and nearly every stranger is a potential threat ready to capture or harm you. How would you feel? How could you possibly reach your destination safely? This is what African American slaves escaping to freedom from bondage in the South faced. A long, difficult, life-threatening journey. Slaves making this journey were alone, cold, hungry, and always in fear. But some were able to get assistance from people along the way. This loose knit network of people offering shelter, food, safety, and encouragement to fugitive slaves is referred to as the Underground Railroad. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. What is this institution called slavery? What made it so horrible? Why was it worth risking one's life to escape? Slavery in America meant people were frequently bought and sold like cattle. They had just enough to survive, were poorly clothed, and were housed in coal shacks, which barely kept out the biting wind. Work from sun up to sun down to exhaustion in the burning sun or freezing cold, and occasionally were brutally punished. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody Captured, knows beaten, the and frequently killed, people were enslaved from Africa and shipped as cargo throughout the world. Ships brought thousands of slaves to America under deplorable conditions. Many got sick and died as a result of lack of food clean water and very poor sanitation. The first African slaves came to the eastern shores of North America in 1619 to Jamestown on a Dutch ship. Early in the 1700s, it was believed that slavery would not flourish and would gradually disappear as it did not appear to be profitable. But the invention and widespread use of the cotton gin and other machinery after the 1790s made cotton growing a successful business for a privileged few in America. Large plantations depended on hundreds of slaves to perform the back-breaking work of growing cotton. Generally, on the more southern plantations, the worse the working and living conditions. Large plantations boomed throughout the South, especially in the lower Mississippi River Valley. Here, Oakley Plantation, located north of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, had over 3,000 acres and over 200 slaves. Plantation owners, or planters as they were called, such as James Perry, owner of Oakley Plantation, prospered and built beautiful homes while hundreds of slaves lived in primitive shacks. In 1850, half of the millionaires in the United States lived between Natchez and New Orleans. Slavery impacted business not only in Louisiana, but throughout the South and the North. The North benefited from slave-produced raw materials, such as cotton, that was made to fabric in these Massachusetts mills. Slaves were often referred to as bondsmen. Their ownership was legal in all but select 
areas of the United States. All slaves held one thing in common. They lacked their physical freedom and freedom to make their own decisions. Considered property, they were bought and sold on the auction block or traded at will without regard for their personal interests, happiness, or well-being. Husbands could be separated from their wives and children from their mothers whenever owners demanded it without any hope of reunion. The major terror among slaves was to be sold south where conditions were even more severe. Slaves were marched south in huge slave gangs or coffles. Slaves had absolutely no control over their destiny. All family ties and culture were destroyed and not allowed to flourish. Some slaves worked from dawn to dusk in the fields with inadequate food and clothing under very brutal overseers who frequently administered severe physical punishment. Others became skilled laborers in trades such as blacksmithing and carpentry and were hired out for wages paid to the owner but not to the slave or as house servants cooking meals in plantation kitchen or caring for the mansion while slaves lived in in shacks. Slaves had little hope for a better life. They had no control over their future and did not share in the profits of their labor. Living in small, poorly constructed cabins, most slaves were forced to tolerate difficult living situations with few possessions. In the early days of the United States, there were small pockets of people who disagreed with slavery. But for the most part, the nation turned its head and looked the other way. But in the North, many felt slavery was wrong. In Vermont, the 14th state, the original Constitution adopted in this building in July 1777 prohibited slavery. Later, slavery was also outlawed in Massachusetts here in the old state house. Despite these states' efforts in the late 1700s and early 1800s, there was not a strong anti-slavery movement in the North or the South. As time progressed, however, small factions of anti-slavery advocates became more vocal and more organized. Religious groups such as the Quakers and other activists formed the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1837. Anti-slavery activist William Lloyd Garrison published the first significant anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. Vigilance committees organized for the care, protection, escape, and rescue of slaves and free blacks that were in danger. Throughout the 1830s and 1840s, Individuals called abolitionists began speaking out publicly against the sins of slavery. America's leading black abolitionist was Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. Douglass escaped to freedom in upstate New York. He wrote and traveled widely speaking out against slavery. Douglass did not stand alone. Many others, such as Sojourner Truth, an early black female abolitionist, was an inspiring speaker, preacher, and a national figure. Garrett Smith, a noted abolitionist from Peterborough, New York, was one of the founders of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society. He was friend, advisor, and a major funder of Frederick Douglass's newspaper, both seen here at a meeting in upstate New York. Many abolitionists voiced their anti-slavery message in all parts of the country, with the greatest concentration here in Boston. The growing anti-slavery movement created tremendous turmoil in the way people viewed the economy, politics, religion, and even their neighbors. 
riots over the slavery issue were a common occurrence in the 1830s. This statue depicts the rescue of a slave from an angry mob in Syracuse, New York. Elijah Lovejoy, an abolitionist and publisher of an anti-slavery newspaper, in 1837 was killed by anti-abolitionists in Indiana and his printing press destroyed. <laughs> While the country continued to debate the issue of slavery, thousands of blacks continued to suffer and many attempted to escape to freedom. Many slaves escaped using the Underground Railroad, which perhaps got its name when a runaway slave named Tice Davids fled Kentucky and was aided by the local farmers. Davids was chased to the Ohio River where he mysteriously disappeared. The slave owner said it was as if he disappeared on some Underground Railroad. The term Underground Railroad is confusing. It was not a railroad and it was not underground. It's not an accurate term because it implies that runaway slaves traveled on direct routes with specific stops, time schedules, and conductors guiding their path. The Underground Railroad was a loose-knit system of people helping fugitive slaves to reach freedom. Those involved primarily relied on help from those that gather here at the African Meeting House in Boston. Free blacks, vigilance committees, and anti-slavery sympathizers help fugitives in their own way. The Underground Railroad is a difficult subject to research because very few records or documents exist. Much was done in secret. Why did the Underground Railroad exist? It existed because people from a wide variety of backgrounds wanted to help slaves escape the chains of bondage. One of the earliest recorded instances of slaves being assisted in their escape was in 1786 when Quakers in Philadelphia helped runaways from Virginia. While it is commonly thought slaves were trying to escape to Canadian cities such as Montreal as seen here, in reality, most were not attempting to go to specific places, but instead were just trying to escape from the horrors of slavery. They went to any place where life hopefully was better and more secure, and where they were able to live in peace, where they weren't beaten and required to toil long hours in terrible conditions. Many slaves fled to Cuba, or Florida or Mexico. In the swamps of Florida they lived amongst the Native American Seminoles and were known as Black Seminoles. Many escaped slaves found refuge in free black communities in northern cities and lived among houses such as these owned by free blacks. Here they were helped by free blacks to find work, shelter, obtain an education in this integrated school and could more easily hide in the established community. Most of the people involved in the Underground Railroad were just normal, everyday people like us. They were farmers, merchants, escaped slaves such as those in the swamps of Louisiana, free blacks such as Lewis Hayden, an active person on the Underground Railroad in Boston, and people with deep religious beliefs that prompted them to help slaves on the run. There were many heroes, including those who were fleeing for their freedom and lives. Mm -hmm. One of the bravest and most well-known people on the Underground Railroad was Harriet Tugman. As a slave on Maryland's eastern shore, she worked fields like this one, developing a strong body and will. Upon hearing of her impending cell, to a southern plantation, she chose to take the risk of escaping to the north. Trudging through marshes, swamps, and rivers, she made her way to where she felt safer, the north. Called the Moses of her people, Harriet Tubman returned 19 times to guide her parents, family, and other slaves to freedom.
Later, she established this home for elderly free slaves in Auburn, New York. Others who fought hard to help runaway slaves included the Quaker who was referred to as the president of the Underground Railroad, Levi Coffin. It is estimated that he guided thousands of runaways fleeing through the countryside of Ohio and Indiana. In most cases, fugitive slaves stayed or settled where they found safety, shelter, employment, and food. One such place was Rokeby, a sheep farm in Ferrisburg, Vermont, owned by the Robinsons, a Quaker family. Original letters tell us that runaway slaves lived and worked for wages at Roke Farms for the Robinsons. Also, for a number of years, the Robinsons conducted a school for black and white children. One such runaway who we know lived and worked there was named Jesse. The majority of escapees were likely to be young men ages 18 to 30. They were tough, hard, desperate, and often armed. While we do not have a painting or a photograph of Jesse, he probably looked something like this. Jesse faced danger everywhere he went. Someone, anyone could capture him, brutally punish him, and maybe even kill him. From original letters, we know that Jesse was a slave in Perquimans County, North Carolina. Jesse labored on a plantation located near Albemarle Sound. He probably worked long hours in the fields, like this one recently planted with cotton. While we do not know the specifics of Jesse's escape to Ferrisburg, Vermont, like many slaves, he faced a difficult and dangerous journey totaling over 500 miles. If Jesse was lucky, he sailed on a boat from Albemarle Sound, North Carolina, to a northern city such as Philadelphia, New York, or Boston. Mm -hmm. But most fugitives, like Jesse, made the slow and arduous journey on foot, through swamps and over dirt roads. If fortunate enough, he might be offered a ride on a wagon pulled by mules or horses, or find a boat he could paddle. He may have slept in the forest, or perhaps he hid in a barn and slept under the hay. He probably ate whatever he could get his hands on, including berries, roots, or wild game. If fortunate, runaways like Jesse were taken in by those sympathetic to their hardships these safe houses served as temporary stopping points for slaves on the move. Perhaps you have a home in your community in which slaves were harbored. Runaway slaves were lodged where there was extra room in the house, cellar, or barn. Once he arrived at Rokeby Farm, Jesse was relatively safe and able to rest, visit, and work. Jesse earned at least $150 working at the Rokeby Sheep Farm over one to two years. He wanted to use this money to purchase his freedom. We do not know if Jesse ever purchased his freedom. Perhaps he made the 70-mile trip along Lake Champlain to the Canadian border. While actual escape routes are difficult to trace, this map illustrates what is believed to be the general flow of fugitive slaves. Slaves in the Deep South found refuge in Florida, Cuba, and Mexico, while slaves in the more northern southern states fled to Canada and states such as New York, Massachusetts, and Vermont. There are many well-known escapes along the Underground Railroad. One famous escape involves a slave nicknamed Box Brown who traveled in a box on a train between Richmond and Philadelphia. It became ever more difficult and dangerous for slaves to escape to freedom. In 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, permitting recapture and extradition of escaped slaves in the entire United States. 
Bounty hunters raided northern cities, capturing both escaped slaves and free blacks, shackled them and returned them to slavery. Tensions between North and South continued to grow. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, focused attention on the atrocities of slavery. It increased Northern sympathies against slavery. The Dred Scott decision further widened the gap between North and South when the Supreme Court found that Scott, a slave brought into a free state by his owner, was not recognized as a U.S. citizen because he was considered property. In 1861, the Civil War fell, with slavery being one of the central issues for which hundreds of thousands fought and died. African Americans, escaped slaves, and free blacks contributed to this cause, serving as soldiers, nurses, guides, and spies. The Underground Railroad played an important role in this struggle by not only providing a means to freedom for thousands of slaves, but it served as a festering reminder that slavery was an institution which had to end. The close of the Civil War saw an end to slavery in America by studying the Underground Railroad, its perils and rewards. It can shine a light on the many brave men and women of all races who risked their lives for the sake of freedom. Now let us take a few minutes to review some of the things we learned in this video. Just fill in the blank with the correct word or words after you hear this tone. Let's get started. Number one, slaves like land or house are considered Number two, a person who spoke out against slavery was called an <laughs> Number three, slaves enabled southern plantation owners to obtain wealth by growing sugar, indigo, and Number four, Harriet was a heroic figure on the Underground Railroad, making 19 missions to free slaves. Number five, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a book titled that helped the nation understand tragedy of slavery. Bring a little water, Sylvie. Bring a little water now. Bring me a little water, Sylvie. Every little once in a while. Come now, Sylvie, come 